July 1979, Constable Andy Laptu turns up to the house of Peter Sutcliffe, a possible murder suspect. He's met at the door by Sutcliffe's wife and is invited in for a cup of tea and a chat. Sutcliffe appears in the living room, a man that doesn't look dissimilar from a Hollywood portrayal of the Antichrist. He has menacing eyes, almost like black dots, black hair, and a finely coiffed jet black beard. The police officer asks him, Peter, do you frequent prostitutes? The response is quick. No, not at all, I've no need, I'm only recently married. After the interview, the cop leaves the house thinking this could be the guy. This could be the animal that's made women fear for their lives for years now in the towns and cities of West Yorkshire and beyond. Laptu goes back to the station and tells his boss that the guy he just spoke to is a dead ringer for the photo fit they have. That boss, one of many cops who would later be accused of doing dreadful police work, screams at the young constable. Anybody mentions photo fits to me again will be doing traffic for the rest of their service. The higher-ups have a tape recording, one they're sure was made by the real Ripper. They're wrong, of course, and their shoddy work will mean flagons of blood spilled on the streets that needn't have been spilled. The case still today is arguably one of the most well-known serial killer cases the UK has ever had, bar London's Jack the Ripper, who it must be said wasn't anywhere near as prolific as the Yorkshire man. There's a saying in England that goes, it's grim up north. If in the late 70s and early 80s you would have walked down certain streets in the industrial cities and towns of West Yorkshire, you wouldn't have disagreed. Those streets, with their dilapidated houses and rubbish piling up in the gardens, were the hunting grounds for the man that would become known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Like many kids back in those days, Sutcliffe was born into the kind of family where higher education was simply out of the question. For most working class teenagers, they left school aged 15 or 16 and they either got a trade or worked in one of the industries in what was known as the Industrial North. One of Sutcliffe's first jobs was a gravedigger, a job perhaps quite apt for a man that would later ditch bodies. It's said that due to the morbid nature of his occupation as a teenager, Sutcliffe sometimes surprised people with his very dark sense of humor. Possibly something that happened during those days shaped what he would become. We'll get around to that later. All we'll say is that Sutcliffe apparently enjoyed washing the corpses, something that shocked his few friends when he told them about it in the pub. We don't know too much about his childhood, but it didn't sound very pleasant. One of six children, Sutcliffe was a mama's boy. As the saying goes, he was tied to her apron strings. His father never really gave much attention to who he considered the quiet, oddball son. This is what one of Sutcliffe's brothers later said about their father. He used to belt the hell out of us when we were kids. I remember when I was about four or five, there was a bit of an argument and he smashed a beer glass into Peter's head. It's also said most of the children at times had to watch on helplessly as their father beat their mother. So this once quiet child with a history of violence undoubtedly didn't have the best of upbringings, but after a series of factory jobs and a stint unemployed, he landed himself work as a heavy goods vehicle operator at a place called T and W H Clark Holdings, and that's a name you're going to hear again. By this time, he'd already married Sonia Surma, a young woman he'd been dating for around seven years. They tried to have children, but after a series of miscarriages, gave up. She also had an affair at one point, but still they stayed together and bought a house in Bradford with her savings from school teaching. The relationship doesn't exactly sound like one made in heaven, but nonetheless, a teacher and a driver living in a semi-detached property looked normal enough to family, friends, and neighbors. Together, the couple had nights out with people, they attended weddings, they were just another couple like any other. What his wife didn't know, though, is that her husband was a voyeur. Sometimes he'd go out at night and just watch women, especially women working in the atrociously run-down red light districts of Leeds and Bradford. In 1969, when Sutcliffe was 23 years old and had been with Surma for almost two years, he began his life of vicious crimes. This all happened after a prostitute had tricked him out of some money. Later the same night, after having a few drinks with a friend, they drove off in the friend's car. This friend is another matter of great importance that we'll come back to later. Sutcliffe told his buddy he wanted to get out of the car for a minute. He wanted to find the prostitute. He couldn't find her, but he saw another woman working the streets, so he followed her. In his hand was a sock filled with a stone. This is what he later admitted about that night. I got out of the car, went across the road, and hit her. The force of the impact tore the toe off the sock, and whatever was in it came out. I went back to the car and got in. His friend might not have seen it all take place, but that didn't matter. The cops had gotten the registration plate off of Sutcliffe's friend's car, so they ended up at Sutcliffe's home the next day. As you already know, this wouldn't be the first time they knocked on his door. In fact, prior to his arrest, they'd interview him nine times. Yeah, this is one messed up case. What you'll discover is that it seems the police looked everywhere but the place they should have been looking. Anyway, when Sutcliffe talked to the cops, he had admitted he hit the woman, but he said he had done so with his fist. 
The cops bought that story and also told Sutcliffe he was fortunate because the woman didn't want to press charges. Had she not been middle class, not a prostitute, you can be sure the police would have urged her to take things further. This was the late 60s, a time of widespread class prejudice and misogyny in England. July 1975, this time the place of the crime is a textile town on the outskirts of the city of Bradford. Sutcliffe spots a woman walking down a quiet street at night. He walks behind her, says something to her, and subsequently strikes her hard on the head with a ball-peen hammer. He then slashes her stomach with a knife. Like many of his victims, she would survive but the attack was so traumatic she later said she sometimes wished she'd died. A month later, he stalked a woman in the town of Halifax, a mill town not too far from Bradford. He asked her something about the weather before hitting her over the head with a hammer. Again, he slashed the victim, this time on the back. She also survived the attack. It should be said, neither of these attacks happened in the red light areas, and the victims weren't prostitutes. The last woman had been out at the Royal Oak Pub in Halifax and had stopped off on her way home to buy fish and chips for her and her husband. Sutcliffe had also been in that pub with the same guy he'd been with in the 1969 attack. At one point, Sutcliffe turned to his friend and said, I bet she's on the game. The next day, that friend read the newspaper and saw a woman had been attacked after leaving Royal Oak. It did cross his mind that the perpetrator might have been Sutcliffe. Both times he could have killed the women, but he was interrupted during the commission of the crimes. Many years later, Sutcliffe told the police about the second attack. I was going to kill her. I had the knife with me at the time. I was going to kill her, but I did not get the chance. Just after the crime, the woman told the police something of great importance. She said her attacker had a Yorkshire accent. This fact, and the fact that both women hadn't been attacked in red light areas, police chose to forget. This is very, very important for you guys to know. See, maybe you don't know that the accents in England can change even when you don't travel too far. You can travel from Bradford to Manchester or to Liverpool or to Newcastle in the Northeast, and the change in accent is unmistakable. These places are all pretty close by, in USA terms anyway. You can drive as little as 20 miles from one city and people can sound different. So not long after that attack, Sutcliffe followed a 14-year-old girl down a quiet country lane. He approached her and they walked for a while and chatted. After about 20 minutes, he hit her five times over the head with a hammer. He then saw car lights and ran, leaving the girl for dead. She needed brain surgery, but when she came out, she could accurately describe her assailant and say what kind of accent he had. What we now have are three crimes that all look very similar and happened not too far away from each other. Then, just a couple of months later, he attacked another woman with a hammer. This time, he stabbed the woman many times and she died. Even though these crimes were so similar, police hadn't linked them together. They had some details about the attacker given from surviving victims. They'd been told he was about 5 foot 8. They knew he had a Yorkshire accent. They knew he had black hair and a black beard. Still, they believed one man was attacking prostitutes and he wasn't the one attacking what they deemed good girls. In fact, the photo fit picture police put in the newspaper was his double. Little did police know that when that photo fit appeared in the newspaper, Sutcliffe joked with his mother-in-law about how much it looked like him. Just a few months later, he picked up a prostitute in Leeds. He drove her to some abandoned buildings where he hit her over the head with a hammer. This time, he used a sharpened screwdriver to stab her 52 times. He then dumped her body in what looked something like a junkyard, but it was just another downtrodden area. This time, he stamped on her, leaving an impression of his boots. That is also important. It was a size 7 Dunlop Warwick Wellington boot. This boot print would be seen again at a crime scene. Over the next year, he attacked more women in a similar style, usually using a hammer to knock them out and subdue them and then stab them. Some of his victims would survive, but not without life-changing injuries. One woman he killed with a hammer and then mutilated her dead body. This time, he left tire tracks behind. That was another clue, since police could investigate what kind of car or at least what kind of tires they were looking for. Still, there were 100,000 possible matches for those tires. When he killed a 16-year-old girl, the police and the press all started talking about him now killing normal people, as if the other victims were inhuman or something. Such were the days, and the cops ashamed themselves at one point by calling the last girl the first innocent victim. They hadn't linked the 14-year-old who survived, which was a pity, since she had given an almost perfect description of him. The cops had been sure they had a prostitute killer, but they were wrong. At one point, they'd even invited prostitutes from West Yorkshire to attend a meeting so they could give them advice and ask them questions. One cop smiled just before the women entered the room and said to another cop, I hope we're not going to catch anything sitting on these chairs. The other cop laughed and replied, well, I kept out of their way just in case. It was only after this murder that police really stepped up the investigation and the female public started thinking, oh, it could be me next. Time and again, the police said, now a respectable woman had been killed. One of the biggest manhunts in English history was shaping up. 
Cops already had a lot of paperwork, so much the station had to reinforce the floor. On October 1, 1977, Sutcliffe had chosen the city of Manchester as his next hunting ground. He made another mistake after paying a prostitute some money and killing her. He realized the five-pound note he'd handed her could be traced. He returned to the part of Manchester where he dumped the body. This was described as a wasteland. When he couldn't find the note, Sutcliffe was enraged. He took a knife and mutilated the body as much as possible, almost taking her head off. The victim had worked on the mean streets, so she'd known to always hide money in a secret compartment in her purse. The police found it, of course. It was after this that the cops narrowed down their search to some 8,000 men. That note was issued by a bank for employee paychecks at certain companies. One of those companies was T and WH Clark Holdings. Sutcliffe was interviewed during his workday there, but the police didn't find anything suspicious about his story. As we described at the beginning, one cop ended up going to his house. There, his wife had said he'd been with her at a party on the night of the murder. She was lying, she had no idea he was a killer, but she was still giving false alibis for him. Then there was another survivor and yet another woman who described a man who was a dead ringer for Peter Sutcliffe. On top of that, the same tire tracks were found at the scene of the crime. Maybe if they hadn't had so much paperwork, they would have known he was a prime suspect. So much information in the days when technology was so backwards might have hampered the case. That or the cops just sucked at their jobs. They even questioned him yet again about why his car was seen so many times in red light areas. It said the Ripper Squad had talked to him several times at this point. In 78, he killed again, twice, each time stabbing and slicing the corpses. He later told the cops about the 78 slaying. I had the urge to kill any woman. The urge inside me to kill girls was now practically uncontrollable. In 79, he killed a 19-year-old girl as she walked home from her clerk job in the town of Halifax. The British tabloid press made it a much bigger news story when a young worker like this could be one of the Ripper's victims. The pressure now on the West Yorkshire police was intense. To say the least, they looked bad. That's one reason they sent the file to the FBI, an agency very experienced with serial killers. It's then that someone posted a tape recording packed into an envelope. It was addressed to the lead investigator. When they played it, they heard, I'm Jack. I see you're having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George, but Lord, you're no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. Obviously, if you know anything about Jack the Ripper letters, you'll know this person was imitating those. Linguists listened to the recording and said this man was from Sunderland and Tyne and Weir in the northeast of England. That's almost 78 miles away from Bradford. And if you know your English accents, people from Sunderland sound nothing like the people from West Yorkshire. Cops had already heard how the attacker was short, had a Yorkshire accent, and how many people had described him as having black hair and a black beard. That didn't matter. They started investigating the man dubbed Wearside Jack. This would become one of the biggest embarrassments in UK policing history. Why? Because it was a hoax. Wearside Jack even sent letters to the Daily Mirror newspaper. One in part went like this. I am the Ripper. I've been dubbed the maniac by the press, but not by you. You call me clever, and I am. You and your mates haven't a clue that the photo in the paper gave me fits. Experts even told the investigators that the letter and the recording were very likely the work of a hoaxer, but the cops stubbornly pressed forward with this line of investigation. The FBI's behavioral unit, the people tasked with catching serial killers in the US, told the Yorkshire cops that the tape was a hoax. They'd studied serial killers, they'd invented profiling, they were leagues ahead of sexist, misogynistic Yorkshire cops. One night, Robert Ressler sat down for some pints in a quiet pub with a Yorkshire investigator. This was the man depicted in the series of Mindhunter, and in real life, the guy that helped bring down the likes of Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy. He said to the cops, you realize, of course, that the man on the tape is not the killer, don't you? He then told them the man on the tape was an extrovert, when they should be looking for an introvert. They also said the guy they were looking for likely worked as a driver for a living. It was being able to move around for a job that gave him cover, he said, adding that the man was likely aged late 20s to early 30s and had some serious mental health problems. Even the surviving victims came forward and said it was not the man that had attacked them. The actual killer, Peter Sutcliffe, as you know, was even put at the back of the suspect list because he didn't have a Northeast accent. As the cops were looking for Wearside Jack, the real Yorkshire Ripper killed three more women and grievously injured two others. In 2005, thanks to DNA evidence that wasn't available back then, John Humble was arrested in the Ford estate in Sunderland. The man, now a poor alcoholic, admitted he'd been fascinated with Jack the Ripper, and that's one reason he pretended to be the Yorkshire Ripper. It was also revealed that out of guilt, Humble had called the police during the investigation and told them he was behind the hoax, but for some reason the cops didn't believe him. Humble was released from prison in 2009. He was given a new identity in view of how much the public despised him. His alcoholism killed him in 2019. But back to Mr. Sutcliffe. The game is almost up. 
The guide that had been out with Mr. Sutcliffe the night he used a loaded sock to hit a woman over the head sent an anonymous letter to the cops marked priority number one. It fell on deaf ears. This is what it said. I have good reason to know the man you're looking for in the Ripper case. This man has dealings with prostitutes and always had a thing about them. His name and address is Peter Sutcliffe, 5 Garden Lane, Heaton Bradford Chipley. To think, the police had already visited this house and talked to the man nine times. The former friend, having seemingly been ignored, even went to the police station and told the cops again he knew who the killer was. He told them he'd been with him when he attacked someone. After Sutcliffe's arrest, the record of this meeting just went missing. Sutcliffe was eventually arrested about a month later, but for a DUI. While waiting for his trial, he killed a middle-aged woman. He also attacked a student at Leeds University and a 16-year-old girl who felt so scared she slept with a knife under her pillow. At this point, cops had been warning women not to go out at night. This caused an outcry. Women marched in the streets, saying why should they have to stay home at night? It was as if the cops were blaming them for going out. This was later called institutional sexism. Believe it or not, Sutcliffe even told his own sisters to stay home at night just to be on the safe side. At the same time, cops on the case were so stressed it led to ill health. The main guy in charge of the investigation, George Oldfield, had a heart attack in 1979. It's thought the stress of the case led to his early death at 61 in 1985. Another cop said this, you know you'd go for a drink somewhere or to your local and they'd ridicule you. On January 2, 1981, Sutcliffe was stopped in his car by police in the city of Sheffield around 31 miles from Bradford. The constable who stopped him soon found out there was a false license plate on the car. The man in front of him also looked exactly the same as the guy whose face had been printed in the newspaper from time to time. They took Sutcliffe to the small textile town of Dewsbury, where he was questioned about the Ripper case. The next day, cops returned to where they pulled him over. They also remembered he'd asked them if he could go for a pee since he was bursting. Lo and behold, where he'd taken that pee, or pretended to, police found a hammer, a knife, and some rope. At the station, police also found that Sutcliffe was wearing clothes that exposed his genitals, a v-neck sweater he wore inverted, so his legs went through the arms. They knew this had to be the killer. He denied it at first, but then with all the evidence being put in front of his face, he broke. He told the police, the women I killed were filth. I was just cleaning up the place a bit. His actions, he claimed, were the orders of God. He said he'd first talked to God when he worked as a grave digger. God came to him through a dead Polish man's grave, a Mr. Bronislaw Zapolski. This was heard during the court trial. While some of the victims were prostitutes, perhaps the saddest part of the case was that some are not. The last six attacks were on totally respectable women. You heard that right. The Yorkshire Ripper was sentenced to 30 years before he could meet with a parole board. Although his sentence was later extended to life without the possibility of parole, a whole tariff as it's called in the UK. He was later diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and sent to Broadmoor High Security Psychiatric Hospital. During his years in prison and at the mental hospital, he was attacked a number of times. One time, a broken coffee jar was shoved into his face. Another time, he was almost strangled to death with some headphone cables. He was stabbed in both eyes with a pen in another attack, losing the sight in one eye and almost the sight in the other. He was stabbed in the neck during another attack. Sutcliffe died in prison on November 13, 2020. He'd been sick for some time with diabetes and he had a heart condition. A couple of weeks after a suspected heart attack, he was diagnosed with COVID-19, for which he asked not to be treated. According to the press, he was secretly buried, with the family being frozen out. This is what his brother had prepared as a eulogy. Peter, all of your family love you as Peter Sutcliffe, although you ruined all our lives when you became the Yorkshire Ripper. In what seems absurd given the horror of the story, the family were allowed to attend the funeral via Zoom. Now, you need to watch Japanese horrific serial killer Tsutomu Miyazaki, The Human Dracula, or have a look at this.